sense of comfort and just a real appreciation of true belonging. We started in Luke's recount of Jesus' return to his hometown in Nazareth. As it's been read already in verse 14 of Luke, a bit of context, Nazareth is not Jesus' first public appearance. We learn elsewhere from the Gospel of John in chapter 4 that earlier Jesus was in another town called Cana where he had healed the son of a royal official King Herod, royal official to the King Herod. So imagine the son of our current PM, it took me a while to remember it, Scott Morrison. Um, the father had travelled to Capernaum, oh, not to Cana, and left his sick son back in Capernaum. And this was a, a miraculous healing that Jesus, when he met the father, didn't need to go back to heal the son. It was like meeting Scott Morrison here on George Street, healing his son, who's at home all the way in Parramatta. So the news of this miraculous healing would have spread throughout that region. It would have been stunning and quickly reached Jesus' hometown. So Jesus is coming back to his childhood home. How did the people of Nazareth respond to him? He would not have been able to keep his presence a secret. People would have been eager to talk with him, if for no other reason to ask if the reports about him were true. So verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So on the Sabbath, he entered the small synagogue in Nazareth to preach what may have been his first sermon in his hometown. He probably found it filled with people who were eager to speak with him. You know, Jesus' family was present, his childhood friends, people who had seen him grow up. And he goes to the front of the synagogue and reads a famous messianic passage from the prophet Isaiah. Verse 17, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He finishes the prophecy, one that Jewish people had read for nearly 700 years by identifying himself as the one spoken of by Isaiah. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine? You've grown up with this guy. You shared woodwork class with him together. He's the son of Joseph and Mary, just regular townspeople. After 30 years of seeing him as a normal person, Jesus goes off and gets baptized in the river by John and then spends 40 days in the wilderness to come back and proclaim he is the Messiah. No wonder their initial response was verse 22. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? When Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah at Nazareth, he told the people that the scripture was being fulfilled even as he read it. The reading mentions four groups. The poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. To proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. See, when Isaiah prophesied 700 years earlier, the Jewish people were exiled and under Babylonian rule. They were poor, having lost everything to Babylon, captives and prisoners in a foreign land. They were oppressed, unable to return to their homeland of Israel. Imagine being unable to go home, living in a foreign land with an unknown culture, different language, different rules. Probably a common story of the refugees in our world today. And Isaiah prophesied that they would return home, be fully restored, and live in security. That would be good news. The people in the audience knew him growing up. But more than that, as Jews, 
they were very familiar with their history in exile, being under a foreign rule. And not only in their history as Jews, it was their present reality. Except it wasn't the Babylonians ruling over them, now it was the Romans. It would have been very difficult for them to feel that sense of security or belonging. Home is not fully restored and there is no comfort or safety in what they experience. It's like going home to find different strangers have moved in and they use the home as they see fit. They help themselves to food in the fridge and if, they're, if you grew up like me in an Asian household, imagine strangers going into your bedroom in their normal clothes, lying on your bed with their shoes on. This reminds me of my good friends in high school, except these are not good friends. These are strangers who have permanently moved in without your permission. So Jesus refers to this prophecy by Isaiah to proclaim that God is going to deliver his people. God is going to act now. He is going to save his people and Jesus will fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. Verse 19 says Jesus was there to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is basically a synonym for the good news of the kingdom of God. As we read ahead, Luke 4, 43 shows that Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. That is to say, God's kingdom, what we sing about, what we praise God about, is coming and has come. It has been realized in Jesus' Jesus' arrival. Jesus was not coming home. Jesus was bringing home to them. What the Israelites had not realized was that Jesus was not here to reestablish a nation or to establish parliament. Jesus was here to bring in God's kingdom. Jesus is bringing in the kingdom of God. That's why he could say in Luke 17, 21, that the kingdom of God is in the midst of you because he was in the midst of them. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, that the kingdom of God has come near because Jesus was near. The Israelites, they were longing for home. They have a long history of stubbornly rejecting God and turning their backs on Him. Over and over, they demonstrate that they are unfaithful to God. They are an unfaithful nation who refuse to enjoy God's promises, His security, and find their identity in God. The Israelites are described by God's prophets as a regularly unfaithful wife, as a stubborn mule. The Israelites were then... Um, God allowed Israelite to be conquered by foreign nations. But we, you and I, we aren't any better than the Israelites and their stubbornness and refusal to obey and follow and trust God. You and I, we refuse to find our security in God too. We're like the three little pigs of the children's story who built our homes out of straw and sticks rather than finding our home in God. We're making our little huts out of straw and sticks. What materials are you finding your security in? Homes are supposed to provide that security, so are we looking for security in maybe having more finances, in a secure job? If so, we will never find it. I had a difficult conversation a few years with my parents when I had to leave the security they thought I had. I had a full-time teaching job, a job that I had studied four years at uni for. And for them, I wasn't allowed to go into ministry until I was secure, until I owned a house, until I was married and and had kids. Then uh, I could go into ministry. But if you ask anyone... When will you have enough to be secure? The answer is always just a little bit more. Looking for security apart from God fills us with anxiety. We don't know what the future holds, 
Will we be able to keep affording those repayments? Will we still have our jobs in five years? Will we still want the same job in five years? Security is not found out there. Also, homes are also supposed to be a place of comfort and a place where we belong. So do we look for the comfort elsewhere because we won't find it? The comfort that we're looking for is only found in God. Maybe we are looking for comfort and belonging in other people. We look for the perfect spouse, who, but then we're disappointed when they don't fulfill our high expectations. We look for our belonging in relationships. One year we're in a close and warm family gathering. The next year the relationship feels strained and cold and distant. Security and belonging. These things, these things that we yearn for, that we find in a home, we can only find in God. Our sin, our rejection of God, that is what separates us from home. There's only one way back home. And the only way, the only way to get back into God's kingdom was what Jesus came here for. You see, the grand story of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is about God restoring our communion with Him, that community with Him, that unity, that relationship with God. We see at the start of creation, in the first few chapters of Genesis, we see that God created a place for people to live, a tropical, fruit-filled paradise called Eden where God lives amongst His people. But then Adam and Eve rejected the security that God provided. Adam and Eve said no to God, and they were thrown out of Eden because of their rebellion. Throughout the Bible, we see it in Moses, throughout Israel's history, the prophets. God is restoring communion to himself. He's planning to restore humanity to himself. From his original intent in Genesis to his final intent in Revelation, we discover that God is all about restoring humanity to himself. In Revelation, we see the parallel of the New Jerusalem, a fruit-filled paradise animated by a cosmic river and with the tree of life. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Oh, that is God restoring people to himself. This city will need no temple to house God because God will be amongst his people. People will enjoy God's presence forever. The whole Bible points to Jesus because Jesus is at the center of God's plan. You see, if you read ahead in Luke, you'll discover that Jesus was rejected by his hometown, rejected by the religious leaders over and over again. Even many of his followers would turn away. One of his disciples would betray him. Some would deny even knowing him. And then he would face the ultimate rejection by being crucified on the cross. Jesus was crucified on the cross and is risen from the dead. We know this. So that we can have security, so that we can belong to God. In short, so that we can have communion with God. This is the pinnacle of the entire Bible. The good news that the kingdom is coming and is made possible because Jesus paid the cost of our rejection of God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, for Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. The home you long for, that yearning in our hearts, that peace that we want, that security, place to say that we belong, it's found in Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't that beautiful news in a world that seems so rushed? It seems like it's so filled with anxiety. 
place where we're never caught up to where we want to be, that in Jesus we can find our rest. Are you looking for peace, for that home to rest? You'll not find it in the possessions, people, or profession. Peace for our souls, peace that is satisfying, like the rivers of life, of water that just keeps flowing, is only found in Jesus. There's a secular song called Home by Edward Sharp. You know, one of those modern folky musics. The lyrics go something like this. You know, Our home, let me go home. Home is wherever I'm with you. Our home, let me go home. Home is wherever I'm with you. I'll spare you my terrible singing voice. Though. But home is not about a location. Home is a person. Your true home is about being in a relationship with God, being in communion with him. Our security, comfort, and belonging is not found in the world. It's found in a relationship with God. So what does that relationship look like? Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 1, 4, and 5, I'm just going to focus on this for a bit. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. A couple of things I'd like to mention about this passage. Chiefly, that a relationship with God means that we are both in Christ and Christ is in us. So we are both in Christ and Christ is in us. What does that mean? Firstly, being in Christ means that we are found in Jesus, that Jesus is our source of security, our source of comfort and belonging. Being in Christ means that we are free from the judgment of sin. Being in Christ means that we are declared righteous. We are robed, covered in his righteousness being in Christ means that we are not weighed down by the burden of our sins because every time we mess up when we fail, we're not filled with guilt. Actually, we're not paralyzed by it. Instead, when we fail, it should point us to what Christ has done on the cross. It should point us to the grace of God. It is paid for. That is true security. Being in Christ also means we don't belong to the world. We don't belong to people's opinions or expectations. In Christ means that we, as we sang, we believe and we belong to God. Who do you belong to? Do you belong to your career? Is that where your identity is found? Maybe you belong to what others think of you? I know for a a lot of us, what do our Facebook profiles say about us? Is, are people's expectations where we get our identity? Or do we belong to God and we know that we are found in Christ? This generation is so connected online. We have unlimited opportunities for our future. We have options to be whoever we want to be. And yet we are also the most anxious generation we have the highest rates of anxiety, depression, and teen suicide than any other generation. And it's because we are struggling to find our place in the world. We are struggling to find where we belong in this ever-confusing world. Are we where we belong? We are constantly swayed by our ever-shifting desires, our identity. We're not sure who we should be. Are we... A doctor? Are we a musician? Are we the person who gets hundreds of likes on an Instagram post? Or are we the person who makes the jokes at the parties? We are searching. We are lost. We don't know where we belong. And the gospel tells us that we belong to God. We belong to God. And that should free us from the pressure and anxiety of searching for our comfort in anything else. 
In Christ, we belong to the family of God. This is home. We are citizens of heaven. We are adopted children of God. We are His. Best thing is, is that our identity doesn't depend on what we do. Our identity, being God's children, is dependent on what Christ has already done on the cross. So we can't lose that. We can't stop being children of God just because we failed again. That is true comfort and belonging, is it not? Secondly, not only are we in Christ, we read that Christ is in us. Abide in me and I in you. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. What is this, to be in Christ and to have Christ in us? It is to say that it is impossible to live a kingdom life without Jesus in us. No amount of church activity, ministry, lifestyle can succeed without Jesus in us. If we want to experience the fruit of being part of God's kingdom, the transformation of our hearts to be more humble, joyful, patient, kind, self-controlled, if we want to experience that change in us, it's not going to come from effort and just trying harder. It is going to come from Jesus dwelling and living in us. If we want to experience the fruit of ministry to not have God work in us, but to have God work through us, we need to have Jesus dwelling in us. This is the power of the gospel, that when we professed faith in Jesus, he placed his spirit in us so that we would be able to bear much fruit. The spirit empowers us to say no to the world and its ungodly desires and to live self-controlled and upright godly lives. So the kingdom of God has come. We are found in Christ and Christ is in us. We are made righteous. Our identity is new. We are righteous. We can't change that. And then Christ lives in us so that we are able to be righteous. In Christ and Christ in us. This is a great truth that we should find much joy and peace and comfort in. And when we are home, it ought to transform everything about us. Our behavior, our relationships, how we view ourselves. But I'll comment on only one aspect just for time's sake, how we greet the stranger. And I've been greeted here just very warmly. It's been wonderful to have Wilson and Ida come and say hi, like I'm coming home here. It's great. But the stranger is the person that we don't know, the person who may have different political opinions to us. The stranger may be the first-time visitor to church, might be the neighbor who lives across the road from us. And as people who are home because of Jesus. We need to be people who welcome the stranger. The stranger is asking the question in their minds, do I belong here or don't I belong? You'll know that if you ever visit another church, you're asking yourself, do I belong here or don't I belong? And I feel like I'm always welcomed in a Christian church. There's a huge difference on the type of welcome I get, on the, or on the type of welcome you feel when we go out to eat, whether we go to a restaurant or whether we're invited to someone's home. At a restaurant, it's all about business. It's about paying for food, having a bill, ordering things. But at home, you're invited warmly with a smile, a hug, like you're amongst family. Do people feel like they are coming home when they meet you? Or do they feel like they've gone to a business where they line up at the cashier, order their things, and then they feel like they belong? So welcome the stranger. Let them feel the acceptance that we have in Jesus. Greet the stranger like you would, as if you were greeting someone coming to your home. Let me finish by saying that as we experience what a relationship with God is like now, when we feel safe, peaceful, joyful, worshipping God, it's merely a foretaste of what home is like in the future. Home only gets better. In the movie The Blind Side, starring Sandra Bullock, 
Not to be confused with the Netflix one, Bird Box. Blindside is based on a true story about Michael Orr, the football star, who uh, he has a mum who's addicted to drugs, he moves home to home, and then he lives uh, as a homeless teenager. He's adopted by Sandra Bullock uh, as a high school teenager. He's welcomed into her house, and she shows him his room, shows him the his bedside table, the drawers, the light, the alarm, his bed, and it all belongs to him. And, and as Michael soaks in the room before him, he asks, it's mine? Sandra Bullock responds, yes, sir. No response. What? So he says, I've never had one before. What? A room to yourself? A bed. Michael had never experienced home in the true sense. Based on his experience of living on the streets, he could not even imagine what it was like to sleep in your own bed. And like him, we can't imagine what it will be like to one day truly be home with God. One day we will be experiencing something far beyond what we can imagine now. This world will pass away. Our bodies will grow old, they will get sick, we will die. We will experience pain and suffering. But even as we experience the joy of knowing God now, there will come a day when we will be home completely. We will be home physically, spiritually, emotionally. One day, we will see God face to face. And I imagine he will smile and say to us, Welcome home. Let me pray. Father, we praise you that you're a good God. And we thank you for your plan to bring us back into communion with yourself. Thank you that Jesus paid the price of our sins. Thank you that we are declared righteous, adopted as your children, and we have your spirit living in us. Empower us to live righteous lives and to be people who welcome the stranger. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Church, are you searching? Are you searching where your heart belongs to? Or have you found, have you found this home where your heart is? Please stand as we respond to God's word. Before the